Good day, viewers. Welcome to Ang Kalusugan Ay Karapatan. I am Dr. Menchit Padilla, and today's topic will be Filipino Resilience in the Times of COVID-19. The American Psychological Association defines resilience as the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, threats, or significant sources of stress. In simpler terms, it is bouncing back from difficult experiences. We Filipinos are known for our resiliency in the face of disaster. The current pandemic has brought about sadness, fear, and anxiety in facing the unseen enemy. But these reactions are normal reactions to an abnormal situation. Psychological factors have a great impact on the mental well-being of individuals. Our deepened connections with family and friends, faith in the Supreme Being, and the Bionian spirit help us rise above the circumstance. This also emphasizes that the delivery of essential mental health care should start in the community. The state has recognized the basic rights of all Filipinos to mental health, the promulgation of Republic Act 11036 or the Mental Health Law. This law affirms the basic right of all Filipinos to mental health. One of the objectives of the law is to integrate strategies promoting mental health in educational institutions, workplace, and in communities. Our episode for today will focus on psychosocial issues affecting resilience and mental health in the Philippines. Welcome to another episode of Kalusugan Ay Karapatan. We are fortunate to have with us today Dr. Anselmo Tronco, Chair of the Department of Psychiatry, Philippine General Hospital, and Dr. Laura Lay, Melanie Elma, Head of the Section of Child and Adolescence, to share with us their expertise on the topic in today's episode, Filipino Resilience in the Time of COVID-19. Good morning, uh, good day, uh, Dr. Lani and Dr. Nonet. Okay, let's ask the first question then, Dr. Lani. What is resilience? Okay, resilience in our context as of now is being able to adapt, being able to live in the new normal after all of the changes brought about by COVID-19, such as the quarantine, isolation, maybe fear, maybe grief. And then for children and adolescents, for them to be able to continue with their development, to be able to achieve their developmental milestones in spite of the changes brought about by COVID-19. So what you're saying is that resilience, when you said adapting, it's really bouncing back despite all of the issues that you mentioned. And it's not really just for children, it's really for children and adults. So Dr. Noneta, so I, I heard about the bouncing back of children, but what about adults? Do we also have to bounce back and adapt to the situation? We all bounce back. Most of us. We do not become shells of our former selves because of the disaster. But I think what is not very much emphasized and not being talked about is we, we have what is inherent in our culture. Our culture helps us bounce back. And there are many, not few. Okay, so, so let's maybe just tackle that part. Bouncing back for adults, how is it manifested? Assuming we have the same scenario of the COVID-19, I will ask both of you on how, how do adults bounce back and how do children bounce back. Let's start with Dr. Nonet. For example, when a person loses a job, as a daily wage earner, some Filipinos in that level of society, what do they do? They learn to sell fruits and vegetables and fish, which they did not do before to earn a living, to survive, to feed their family. Or for example, when teachers like us cannot go to the hospital to teach and to do our work, what do we do? I learned how to connect with social media and learn Viber and Messenger, and therefore now does not feel the physical isolation because I could work from home and I could connect through my gadget to the Department of Psychiatry. So what you're saying is that to become productive, 
you have to use another tool or come up with another way of earning a living. And that way, because of the situation, you're actually bouncing back. Okay? But what about in children? How does it work? Paano pa ang resilience sa bata? Well, we have um, a change in situation. Like, they're now at home. They're used to being in school, being with their friends. But they are now able to adjust to the family situation. And the parents are also there to support them in terms of their resilience. Children may have their own resilience. And the parents and caregivers are important in terms of supporting this resilience and even fostering this resilience. They may bounce back by keeping in touch in spite of not being able to go to school, but they keep in touch through online, just like in adults. And they may also keep in touch with their elderly grandparents, so call them also online, and maybe even learn new skills at home being able to um, participate in chores at home and that will help them also adapt. They, they have responsibilities, new responsibilities, and they will come out of this pandemic as um, more resilient. Okay, so, so is it normal for a person to be resilient? Yan ba automatic na because of the current disaster? My, there's an innate thing inside me that will tell me that I have to be resilient. Does it work that way? The human impulse, regardless of adversity, is to grow well and healthy. Okay. That is the basic so nature basic of the human being. Even trees, even plants. Adversity brings out always the need to survive, the need to thrive, the need to grow. Okay, so that, so that is the normal reaction uh, to find another way to bounce back and adapt to the situation. But is it the same with children? Yes, yes, it's the same with children. Um, they may even be resilient in terms of the crisis that we are having now but they need more of the support. They need more support because they have not had the experiences that will make them as resilient as adults. Okay, so they are also resilient, but they will need our support so that they will be able to become more resilient and to come out of this pandemic being more resilient. Okay, I mean, that's, that's really nice to hear, but then if you, if you watch the television or listen to the radio, they don't talk about resilience at the beginning. They talk about psychosocial issues that have come to us adults and children. And I want to ask you now, what are those psychosocial issues that are we talking about? If we're saying that the automatic uh, reaction is resilience, so what are these psychosocial issues that are being mentioned? Let's start with Dr. Nonet. There has been a lot of studies globally about the nature of psychological reactions using instruments that document the population's reaction. And what is written or what is shown in YouTube or the internet is that it's really post-traumatic stress disorder because disaster is traumatic, it's anxiety, it's depression, it's stress. But we need to take caution when we interpret that data when they say 30 to 50 percent of these people who are in the pandemic like COVID-19 are anxious, depressed, have traumatic stress disorder or depression. Those data does not mean that 40 to 50 percent of us are ill these reactions in fact should be better viewed as in this abnormal situation these are normal emotional reactions of normal human beings like us only a few maximum 10 percent will actually be what we call ill and will need specific special psychiatric or psychological intervention okay what about children dr lani um, for children, when it comes to looking at the psychosocial perspective, we have to look at their situation. 
for example, school closures, it's very, it's a very important situation that they have to adjust to as of now. Um, their life is in school, part of their support network is school, and school closures affect so many children. They may have lost graduation ceremonies that they were looking forward to, and also they may be receiving mental health services in schools, and then these are no longer available. Okay. Another psychosocial situation that is important for children would be the effects of the quarantine, effects of the isolation, possible separation from their caregivers, from their parents. These are very important. And for children also grief, like if a parent is lost because of the illness, they may be dealing with grief. And uh, the parent is usually the person who will be there when the child, child is fearful or when the child needs support. And then what if the parent is the one that is lost during this situation? And our children are also vulnerable to the effects, the economic consequences of this pandemic. So child poverty may have many effects, like one of them would be an increase in the learning gap because those who are in higher income families may be able to continue with online learning in spite of the school closures. They may be able to continue because they have internet, they have computer, but what about our younger children? And also the psychosocial situation for children would include an increase, studies have shown that there may be an increase in abuse, maltreatment, um, domestic violence during periods like this, like COVID-19. Okay, so, so there are the, many situations yeah, affecting them. So those are situations, but what is the actual um, psychological concern? Because Dr. Nodit was saying that uh, there's a level of anxiety that's heightened. So in, in children, are we also talking about anxiety or is it more of depression or what is the response to the situations that you mentioned? Which are the more common ones? Okay, so the response depends on their age, on their developmental level. No? So in preschoolers, we may see that they have fears of being alone, they may become more clingy towards their parents, they may have nightmares, sleep changes, appetite changes, and um, they come out more in behavior. Okay? They may not be able to say and explain that I feel afraid. They may not even know that they are feeling afraid. They may just be angry or irritable. There may be an increase in temper tantrums, but it's actually a reaction. Okay? Um, for school-aged children, they may be able to talk about being anxious or being sad. And then you can see them isolating themselves or maybe being more clingy also. Or sometimes they may have appetite changes or even sleep changes. They can also have nightmares. And then for our teens, behavior and emotions also. They can talk about what they feel. They are usually very much involved when it comes to um, situations where there is discrimination or injustice. They know how to react already to our situation. And then it may also be difficult for them to follow quarantine rules. Okay, so that can be a, a sign, a symptom, yeah, when it comes to adolescents. So, so that's interesting. Depending on the age group, the, the manifestation can be different. And uh, we have to be very uh, conscious that for the younger age, they may not be able to express. They cannot say, I'm anxious, I'm sad. I'm afraid, but actually in behavior it can manifest. Um, Dr. Nodet was saying that um, this is normal. Okay, so it is, well, of course, it's normal to be anxious because we're all anxious. All of us are anxious. But when do you know that it's becoming an abnormal level of anxiety, Dr. Nonet? There are two dimensions to look for. On top of feeling anxious, 
what is it that are the other things that a person is experiencing? Is it difficulty in concentrating? Is it difficulty in sleeping? Is it becoming irritable when you relate with others? Is it the inability to keep still and put attention so that you could accomplish tasks? A range of cluster or you're experiencing a lot of physical symptoms that make you feel that you're really sick and you are thinking what's wrong with me and you worry about it. And then the period. Some people, it can be in a prolonged period that they already experience, for example, the feeling that they are really sick and they already even become feel depressed. Okay, so th that's a good point. You're saying that anxiety is not really depression, okay? And it, it, is, it, is, it is normal to be anxious when you're in, there's a new situation. So now my question is, when, what is the definition of depression and how do you know or how will a family member know that somebody in the house is getting depressed? Depression at the first level is a human reaction. It's part of our lives. We feel sad. But when we become depressed to say that there is reason for concern, there are many other things beyond the feeling. We lose interest in things that used to make us feel pleasure. We could have difficulty in sleeping, or we oversleep. We can overeat, and we don't have appetite. We can't concentrate. We become retarded, we don't move about, or we just sleep the entire day, or we lose the hope, and we become even thinking of ending our lives and that not, life is not worth living. Put all these together, the person becomes unable to again function. And he will not be able to earn a living. He will not be able to relate with friends. He will isolate himself with people and eventually becomes a vicious cycle that they feel that life is not worth it. So what you're saying is that if there's somebody in the house who seems to be, who stopped moving on and becoming productive, or let's say uh, just started isolating, himself from the rest, that could be a sign that something is going on and that person may need professional help. Uh, so it's not always verbal, it can be something that you can observe. Is it the same with children and adolescents? Because right now, the concern is not just uh, the children can watch television or play outside, but the, the, the peer system in the adolescents is different. So are we expecting the same reactions, Dr. Lani? Actually, if we talk of uh, criteria for the diagnosis of depression, it's similar with children. So like what Dr. Tronco told us, um, it's a combination of different signs and symptoms. It's not just a feeling of being depressed, but it has to be in combination with other signs and symptoms. What may be prominent in children and adolescents will be physical signs and symptoms. Like they say they have a headache, every day I have a headache. Or for younger kids, stomach ache, I don't want to go to school, masakit ang chan ko eh. So the physical signs and symptoms may be the additional manifestation in children and also when they are irritable they may be both either depressed or anxious and it comes out as irritability tantrums okay. so um, the manifestations may be the same as in adults but we have additional behaviors to observe when it comes to children and adolescents so it's really very different because in adults, it can be a sign of withdrawal or isolation. You're saying now that it is possible in the children, it will be possibly tantrums mm -hmm. and uh, having a lot of physical signs. So uh, earlier, Dr. Nonet was saying that out of all the patients who are anxious, maybe about 90% will really just spring back and uh, uh, to normal life, and only 10% will need professional help. When we say they need professional help, what does it mean, Dr. Nonet? The first thing is really to determine whether or not this person is sick of what psychiatric condition. I think that's the first step. The correct diagnosis given a thorough assessment, even through the internet. It doesn't have to be face to face the uh, chancellor has come up with a system where there's the bayanihan in PGH 
people can call and they can be scheduled for telemedicine in PGH. So there is no reason why if you don't, if you need help and assessment, that you cannot be assessed because it's COVID. The important thing is that when you feel that you have emotionally responding beyond the normal reaction, have the courage, have the no fear in seeking help. I think that's the most important thing. With the correct diagnosis, what is the most important thing that should be given attention? That one, to engage this person or you will be engaged to put your reaction in the context of a still normal human response. There is a part that is normal and there is a part that needs to be treated with medication and with specific psychiatric intervention. Three, your family will have to be involved, mainly because in the context of the Filipino patient, we will not go far if we do not involve our families. Okay, so I actually want to commend uh, the Department of Psychiatry because they have come up with a hotline for health workers. And sometimes it only really means having to talk to somebody to tell you that it's actually okay, it's all right, and you're, what you're feeling is, 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 is also the same as what I'm feeling. We, we, we've mentioned many times Filipino resilience, but in Tagalog, what is resilience, Dr. Nonet and Dr. Lani? Is there a Tagalog word for resilience? I think to capture the Tagalog concept of wellness, the first, it actually did not come to me. It only came to me when you brought that question. I think it's really uh, the Tagalog speaking people could relate to this very well. Lakas ng loob. Lakas ng loob. Okay. Kasi yun yung nawawala when they become emotionally weak. Eh. Okay. Yung isang nakikita natin na describe, nanghina ang loob. So that's why I'm saying lakas ng loob might be a very good way of capturing resilience, which is English. Parang sinasabi mo, malakas ang loob ko, ano man ang mangyari sa akin, ay magagawan ko ito ng paraan. Yes. Kung mahina ang loob ko, ay hindi na ako kikilos at Maghihintay na lang ako. Yes. So, lakas ang loob. What about you, Dr. Lani? What do you think is a good word for Filipino resilience in children? Uh, how do we describe it? Because when you're talking, majority of our patients are now, um, uh, will speak in Tagalog, and they'll say, you cannot just tell them, resilient tayong mga Pilipino. So, what is your Tagalog word? Um... Well, I don't know exact na Tagalog word no? <laughs> to describe resilience, but I would agree that lakas ng loob would be a nice way of saying Ay, salamat. it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, even in children. Although, um, it may be vague when it comes to talking with children if you just say lakas ng loob. With children, we tend to be very concrete. No? We don't just say, Ay, naku, kailangan magpakabait ka. You have to be very specific about what the behaviors are, what the behaviors for the child to be said to be mabait. What are the behaviors required? So maybe in children, if we say resilience, to be resilient, we have to say the exact behaviors. Not to be able to um, follow the routines at home, to be able to be calm, in spite of the changes at home, to be able to keep quiet when you have to keep quiet, to be able to play when it's time to play. Okay, so you may have to define resilience in very specific um, behavioral outcomes with children. Okay, so again, the management is different. Okay, so in adults, we're talking about moving forward and productivity. And for children, you want to be specific with certain attitudes. Uh, we've talked about fear, sadness, anxiety, depression. And I think what's important now is how do we transition a, uh, 
adults and adolescents and children moving from a, a world of being so, so negative right now because of the anxiety to something more positive? Dr. Nonet. There are many points of view to answer that question, but I personally feel that it has not been quite discussed, talked about, and not being given much attention. We, as a people, as Filipinos, we may have to take a hard look at what is actually embedded in each one of us as a value. We have the values that will make us resilient in COVID-19. One, we are fearful, anxious, depressed. We are actually grieving in a community. There is communal grief. And what does that lead to? In this communal grief, we try to find meaning in this loss. And what do we hear? We see the sense of community in the Bayanihan spirit. Despite our difficulty, we are able to see what can we do to be part of the process of healing in this COVID. That is very Filipino. Two, before COVID and more during COVID, we are really a prayerful people. And this sense of connectedness and spirituality in the accounts of people who survived COVID, they survived COVID, they almost died. The single most important thing that they feel made them hold on and live is a sense of prayer and connectedness to God. More than the medicine, more than many things, they feel that it was God's connection that made them survive. That's two. Three, in the past 20 years ago, 30 years ago when disaster strikes, there are many stories about how humor makes us feel relieved, a respite from the sense of drudgery and pain. In Pablo Cagen de Oro, in Real, there is still a sense of humor and sense of positivism. In the Filipino, that is, I think, something we should recognize and we should look into ourselves. We have that sense. Four, the very language when we ask, Kamusta ka? It's not how are you, how is the weather in the Western world. Kamusta ka means I want to find out how you are feeling at this point. It is a sense of human connection in our day-to-day -day life. So put all this together. There are a lot in us embedded in a culture which is in each one of us that makes us resilient as a people. So, so, Dr. Nonet, I, um, so sometimes it's, we have to do it consciously. And I think that's what's lacking among ourselves and even, even the current situation. We don't talk about the, the good things that are happening to us. We only talk about the challenges and the obstacles and the, the bad things that are happening. So, uh, do you suggest that we make this like a, an exercise for, for everybody that we, we explore uh, what we can be grateful for? That, that kind of point of view, gratefulness, if you pause a little, if you ask what is it that we should be grateful for or what we are grateful for, I think it's going to spin to draw and have an internal discourse in our minds or among our friends. And you'll be amazed that you'll end up feeling good and happy because there are many things that are very good that are also happening in this pandemic. Many things, but we need to have an internal discourse and we need to converse and talk about it. But it's not done. Eh? Yes. What, what about uh, Dr. Lani? Let's talk about children. Is, it, is this a good thing to... To work on? Um, actually, there are beneficial consequences of this pandemic. Like the parents are at home, there is increased social support for these children, and maybe the parents can model these values for them. So the values of um, 
as Dr. Tronco mentioned, being grateful, the value of humor may be translated into value of play with children. Um, they can benefit from the presence of the parents during this time of pandemic to be able to absorb all of these values that uh, we as Filipinos have. So it's similar, but we have to transmit it to our children. But maybe first of all, since there's a lot of anxiety, maybe even confusion, maybe the kids do not really understand it very well. Maybe they have their own questions. We would also have to speak to them at the level that they can understand. Like for preschoolers, we have storybooks in Filipino that we can read to them. We can read them together and they give information about COVID and how to protect themselves during these times of COVID. And there are videos that you can watch together. And the children can be helped to be able to do something like for PGH, for the health care workers. We ask children to make drawings and to submit them to the section of child psychiatry. Some made drawings, some made art, um, artistic productions, and we compiled all of these and gave them to the healthcare workers. So this will make the children feel that there is something I can do during this pandemic. I can be um, productive and responsible also during the pandemic. And for teens, um, they are also able to do a lot like they have been able to make masks, they have been able to make face shields and then donated this to hospitals. And maybe even there were some students who tried to find donors to help a particular institution. Okay, so we are able to empower also our children and adolescents. So the message I'm getting is that there has to be a conscious effort to talk about resilience, to talk about the positive things that COVID has brought to our lives. We talked a lot about BGH, but do, do, do we have this, do we have these services throughout the country, Dr. Nonet? Because I think uh, everybody's anxious, so we've got to find out how are we going to reach to the 100 million Filipinos right now and half of them being anxious with the current situation. Again, I would like to put this premise. Disaster is danger and opportunity. We always talk about danger and suffering, but we need to highlight the opportunity that COVID brings. So in that perspective, from the viewpoint of mental health, because I'm an advocate for mental health for the country, this is the opportunity for the formal health system to respond, to engage in conversations about emotional reactions to the crisis. And that it's the best thing we can do to make us survive. So is this available in the community, Dr. Nonet? I mean, I know we have very limited, uh, we have very limited psychiatrists, but how are we going to reach out to all of this uh, uh, to all the Filipinos. Like the health system, the mental health and emotional aspects of health is the last in the list, even in terms of money, in terms of training, in terms of discourse. Uh, so, very nil. But I'd like to say that hopefully, because of this, people will listen and say, let's invest in mental health in the community because there is only 700 psychiatrists in the country. We cannot respond to the level of the community, but the psychiatrists could help people in the local health um, system. The barangay and the doctors and the nurses, we could help them acquire some skills to engage on emotional issues that are relevant to becoming well. So, so what is it in the mental health law that's going to push for what you are recommending? It is already a requirement. The universal health care has in it mental health as a particular aspect of the universal health care. 
And so, since the Philippines is devolved from the province to the district, to the rural health unit, to the barangay, there will be a cadre of people with a level of expertise defined by PhilHealth, I think. There will be remuneration or cost of it. And then there will be guidelines on how people will be able to provide the service depending on the kind of need at the level of the barangay. That is a dream work, but it can be done. It can be done because, because there is a technology. Social media is there. Medicine work. The tools to make people feel better and have the lakas na loob is also there. And as a people, the Filipino health worker is a feeling people. So it is not difficult to actually create the services. Okay, that's good. So what are we looking at uh, for the implement? Um, how do we look at how we will deal with these issues now in a new normal? I'm going to ask Dr. Lani because 50% of the population is really pediatric. And that means you've got 50 million. And even if you just have a fraction of that 50 million with these kind of problems, how are we going to deal with it in the new normal? Well, um, since most of our children are supposed to be in school, I think it's very important that we are able to bring back learning. It can be online learning, but if possible, if there are other measures that can be done for them to be able to go back to their schools. Because in the past, we have made use of schools the teachers, the guidance counselors, to be able to reach out to these children. We cannot reach out to all of them nationwide, but we can devise programs for teachers to be able to train them to pick up problems in the children and to be able to manage them at the level of the schools. And we can also reach out to the pediatricians because they are all over the country and then they are in touch with these children and adolescents so we can speak with them. They will be able to pick up depression and anxiety and maybe manage them initially so the, the ones that will be referred to us will be the really difficult and complicated ones. But they can be managed already in the community through our schools, the teachers, and the pediatricians. So the message is handling mental health cannot be left to the psychiatrist. We have to engage the different sectors of society from national government to local government, the educational system, as well as the network also among the physicians. So just one final message from our two guests. Uh, I'll start Dr. Lani. Uh, final message to our viewers and uh, the general public and to the doctors. Okay, so to our viewers, we have to be, believe in our, uh, in the resiliency of children. We have to believe in it and then to foster, support it, maybe teach coping strate strategies if needed. Sometimes it will just be being there with them, accompanying them on this journey of resilience. And um, for our doctors, maybe if you are just caring, you are a caring physician, that is enough. It will be therapeutic. It will help with the mental health needs of the children and adolescents. And if in spite of your being caring, supportive, it's not enough, then please do um, refer to a mental health professional. Dr. Nonet. I'll Finally. bring it to my most important thought that take a hard look within ourselves. Discourse within yourselves and friends. There are many values in us that makes us survive this and make us resilient. Our sense of prayer and spirituality. Our connectedness with friends and family. Our sense of community captured in the word by any hand in the way we engage one another and start a conversation, which is really talking about how you and I feel. And most important of all, the sense of humor, because laughter is a single most important action that makes us feel better regardless of the circumstances. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Lani and Dr. Nonet. Thank you for explaining Filipino resilience and telling us that we have it, and that means we'll be able to get over this crisis. Maraming salamat sa inyong lahat. The Chinese character for crisis denotes danger and opportunity. In the same breath, this pandemic brought about fear, sadness, and loss of control. Our connectedness, our sense of family and community and faith, our core values that are embedded in us, making us Filipinos resilient in the time of COVID-19. Thank you for watching Kalusugan Ay Karapatan.